Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Tonight, a shakeup in Uvalde. Its school district police department just got new leadership. It's Chief Pete Arredondo now on administrative leave with that school district. And even though he was recently sworn in on city council, he could lose that job if he misses two more city council meetings. The night team's John Paul Barajas in Uvalde, where residents are watching all this play out. He should never be allowed to work in law enforcement again, I, my personal opinion. That opinion of Uvalde CISD Police Chief Peter Dodondo was echoed by people who didn't want to go on camera, along with concerns about why it took the district so long to place him on administrative leave. Yeah, I think it's kind of ridiculous. I just don't understand why they're being so slow with this investigation. Bravo. It's about time. It's about time. It's been almost a month. Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell said he wanted to wait for the investigation to be completed before making any personal decisions. A statement from Uvalde CISD says his change of heart came because of, quote, a lack of clarity and unknown timing of investigation results. Residents we spoke to said this is just one of many things that needs to happen. Next is his resignation at City Council. His inaction and inability to own up to him being an incident commander. Yeah, he can't, he can't be my councilman. I want better representation than that. Kimberly Hammond took it upon herself to find a legal way of doing just that, highlighting city rules that state three missed meetings signifies the vacating of your seat. City Council voted against a requested leave of absence for Arredondo Tuesday night, meaning he's missed one meeting so far. Him being vacated of his seat or him showing up to face the families is a win for you regardless. Either way, absolutely. Ideally, he will resign his position. John Paul Barajas, KSAT, 12 News. So, and while, so while Arredondo is on administrative leave, we're told that Lieutenant Mike Hernandez is going to act as police chief. We asked the district if Arredondo is going to be paid during his leave. A spokesperson said the district is not going to release that information. And that continues to be a frustration. The lack of information being released in this case. The mayor of Uvalde says Uvalde's district attorney is to blame. In a letter dated June 8th, Uvalde's DA requested any records or reports involving that shooting be withheld. She signed the letter Christina Mitchell and says the release of records would interfere with the Texas Rangers and FBI investigation. Mitchell has said she expects that investigation to, could take six months or longer before her office receives it. But we continue to learn more in public testimony. The director of DPS saying the classroom officers needed to enter was not locked. The classroom was not locked. The gunman could have been taken down three minutes into the response. State Senator Rolando Gutierrez, excuse me, Roland Gutierrez says there are several questions that need to be answered. He says now filing a lawsuit against the Texas Department of Public Safety is what he has to do after they fail to respond to his open records request. He says there is a concern that the law enforcement agencies in Uvalde couldn't or didn't communicate with each other. Because none of the radio communications by any law enforcement unit of, where, of whichever entity they belong to. None of those communications worked inside that school. None of the 911 calls were dispatched to anyone inside that building. What happened on May 24th was a law enforcement failure of infinite proportions. DPS Director Steve McCraw named Pete Arredondo as the incident commander who reportedly did not have a radio on scene. McCraw said policy would not allow DPS to take control of the, of the scene. State Senator Gutierrez says DPS later clarified an active shooter situation trumps all protocols since the response is to get rid of the threat. The state senator says it's time to learn the shortfalls from every agency involved in this investigation, including the response from DPS. 21 people were killed in that tragic shooting. And during a hearing, the DPS director was asked that if the attacker could have done as much damage as he did if he would have had a bat, a revolver, or even a knife. Now, Steve McCraw, Steve McCraw excuse me, said no. Today, the initial autopsy reports were released, and they show the damage that an AR-15-style weapon can cause. In Washington, Congress is discussing gun reform legislation. The Senate's current plan includes language on red flag laws, mental health, also school safety, but it wouldn't raise the age to buy assault-style weapons from 18 to 21. The Senate is going to hold a second procedural vote to move the bill forward tomorrow morning.
Now, the trauma from that deadly day in Uvalde has brought attention to the need for resources. The Uvalde Together Resilience, Resiliency Center is helping families with things like counseling. The FBI and DPS set, set it up. It's mostly run by the Ecumenical Center and the Uvalde County District Attorney. The night team's Lee Waldman shows us how it works. Whatever anybody needs, whatever any families need, we're going to provide it right here. And if it's not here, I'm going to get it here. The Uvalde Together Resiliency Center is in a temporary facility right now, put together by the Texas Department of Emergency Management. District Attorney Christina Mitchell took us through before families started arriving for the day. Both agencies and families that are seeking services, they'll check in with the American Red Cross here. Inside, there are tables where families can get legal advice, counseling, consulate services, workforce commission services, and victim services, all while their kids play safely and get their own counseling nearby. We, we know they don't want their children out of their side. Outside, nine small private pods for one-on-one -on -one counseling and three larger spaces for families. There's been a constant stream of people since the shooting happened. There's not one person that was not touched by this in Uvalde. Not one person. Mitchell's office has been working with the governor's office, the ecumenical center, and the Pulse nightclub resiliency center on a more permanent space for long-term care. The county has purchased a building with the assistance of the governor's office. It was an old bank building on Main Street in, in uh, Uvalde. The building should be fully renovated and ready in November. Mary Beth Fisk is the interim director of the center. She's the CEO of the Ecumenical Center in San Antonio. This is their third mass shooting event to respond to. Their first, Sutherland Springs. Their second, El Paso. Being able to learn from others' experiences is important to help us from to making any missteps and try to be as attentive to the families as needed. Fisk says they're committing to this community, vowing to stay for at least the next five years and then reevaluate from there. We learn strategies um, when we go through difficult times. We learn strategies of how we can handle those emotions, but it's equally important to know that that's not on a timeline. The Ecumenical Center has 20 counselors in Uvalde right now. Now, they try and match families and individuals with their same counselors every day to help create a lasting, trusting relationship. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. That resiliency center is at 215 Veterans Lane in Uvalde. If you need them, you can call 830-276-1369. The other number is right there, second on the list. It's 210-364-1459. Now, there's also a 24-7 helpline, that number, also on your screen. That center is going to be open the entire month of June from Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. through 7 p.m. And then starting July 1st, its days are going to shift to Tuesday through Saturday. And coming up tomorrow night on the Night Beat, we're going to sit down with a fourth grade student who is going to the Resiliency Center and taking advantage of all they offer. She talks about the day that changed her life forever and shares how she is making sure the victims are not forgotten. Listen to the story of 10 year old Aurelia Santos tomorrow on the Night Beat. And our coverage on Uvalde continues on our social media pages. You can also find the latest updates on KSAT.com. Right now you can read more about what we've learned about the response and the gun measures that are now being discussed. This is something no parent should ever go through. And today a mother was forced to relive the moments that her three-year-old son was killed. Melanie Santos spoke before the man accused of killing her son. Eric Trevino is accused of shooting that boy back in 2017. Police said that the boy was sleeping in the back of his family's car as they drove along New Laredo Highway. Officers say that someone pulled up next to them and fired towards their vehicle, hitting that boy. Santos remembered the very moment that a doctor told her her son wouldn't survive. He allowed me to go see him and tell him goodbye. Yeah. Prosecutors say that Trevino was picked out of a photo lineup and owned a gold-colored Honda that matched the car at the scene. But Trevino's lawyers say that he's innocent and that his tattoos are proof that he'd never drive a Honda. If you see on his forehead, he's got the word Cadillac. He's got a Cadillac emblem. If you look, thank you. Cadillac emblem down there. Prosecutors say that Trevino tried to return the Honda after learning that police put a call out for that vehicle. Testimony in this case continues tomorrow.
Is staffing shortages affecting the Bear County courts as part of our case at Q&A interview at six tonight? We spoke with District Attorney Joe Gonzalez about the shortage of prosecutors. The DA says usually they lose around 20 prosecutors in a year. In half the year so far, they've already lost 27. The DA says they're losing people to either smaller counties where the workload is less or bigger cities like Dallas and Houston where the pay is more competitive. So the prosecutors left behind are ending up doing double the work. We have this prosecutor issue that we've got to do something about because what are we going to tell victims of crime? Sorry, we can't get to your case because we don't have enough people. Uh, we can't do that. We, we, we won't do that. Uh, and that's why we we do what we do. That's why our prosecutors work around the clock. The DA goes on to say he hopes to get better funding to help bring in new hires, and he's already asked Bear County commissioners to help with prosecutor pay. Still ahead on the night beat, San Antonio police arrested two people in recent arson cases. And you're going to find out what one of the suspects told investigators. Really interesting stuff. But plus, the Taliban now asking world leaders for help. The dramatic disaster prompting this unusual request. Also, a plan to save drivers some cash at the pump. How much President Biden's proposal could save you, but also why it may come to a screeching halt before it gets to Congress. It's next on The Night Beat. President Biden's gas tax holiday proposal already facing questions just hours after his announcement. The president asking Congress to give Americans a three month break on the federal tax. That's 18 cents per gallon for regular gas, 24 cents per gallon for diesel. But even some Democrats questioning whether it would actually make a difference. Uh, we have now evidence to think that the oil companies would pass that on to the consumer. Now, I fully understand that a gas tax holiday alone is not going to fix the problem, but it will provide families some immediate relief. Yeah, officials aren't so sure. They say there are no guarantees whether drivers would see a difference. The proposal also has strong opposition among Republicans, so it is not expected to pass Congress. And now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. A powerful earthquake now blamed for killing at least a thousand people in Afghanistan. A state news agency reported 1,500 more people were injured. So this happened early today. The quake flattened stone and mud brick homes. People created makeshift stretchers to get people to medical facilities. And in a rare move, the Taliban supreme leader made a plea asking the international community for help. Now here at home, arson investigators announcing that they arrested two people for two fires on the city's east side. One of those fires was last month. The other was back in March. And the March one is the fire that 34-year-old Catherine Basignana is accused of setting. Investigators say that someone started several small fires inside the Friedrich Building on Commerce. And according to an affidavit, Basignana lit the fires to better see inside the building. In a separate case, 37-year-old Cruz Rivas is accused of setting an abandoned home on fire. That was on Crockett Street back in May. So an update now on the baby formula issue. Yes, three more Operation Fly formula missions are going to take place this weekend. The largest is a truck convoy of Gerber formula coming from Mexico. And that alone is going to bring in 1 million pounds of formula into the U.S. The White House says that other types of formula are coming from Australia and Germany. And after this weekend, the U.S. will have imported the equivalent of 19 million eight ounce bottles. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. In case that explains, it's taken on several topics, including immigration, affordable housing, black history. Today, the team behind it received a Gracie Award for Best Local Television News Magazine. Anchor producer Myra Arthur, show creator Lexi Salazar accepted the award from the Alliance for Women in Media. The team honored for the episode explaining protective orders in Bear County. Also in attendance, editor Valerie Gomez, former executive producer Brina Monterosa, News Director Bernice Carney, and President and CEO of Graham Media, Catherine Badlamente. We are very proud of the work the Explains team is doing. By the way, if you pull out your phone right now and scan this QR code, you can watch the full KSAT Explains episode right now or other episodes. You can always also head to our website at KSAT.com. All right, now we want to take 
A live look outside right now, 89 degrees, and yeah, we were talking about um, how hot it was today, Adam, but here's the thing, there's stuff that we're watching for next week. That's what's got us yes. really excited. Your stuff, stuff, yes, that's the focus, <laughs> that little stuff, the stuff next week. Stuff in the form of a weather pattern shift, a weak little cool front dropping in, or a not as hot front. Triple digits, though, through the weekend. That weather pattern shift comes around Monday, and we're gaining confidence confidence in some rain chances, but still cautiously optimistic. Let's take a look at the temperature trend. Let's start with that. Keep in mind the average high is 93, 100 tomorrow, 102 on Friday and about 101 Saturday and Sunday. Then the changes come 95. I'm expecting on Monday and yes, I went there on Tuesday in the 80s, 89. That's the stuff. It, it, it's a start, right? And it, it's something, 89. And there is the potential it could be even lower than that. The possibility exists. There are a few possibilities on the table, but I'm leaning more toward that, so maybe down into the upper 80s by Tuesday. And that's also our best chance of rain. All right, let's talk about the heat so far, though, this June. If June ended today, First, it would be the hottest June on record, and this is the June we've had the most 100 degree days on record. Second place was 2009 with 12. So far, we've had 13, and we're going to tally up even more. So already, we have the record for 100 degree days in June this year, and the average temperature this month, over 88 degrees. That's first place by a long shot. 1990 was the previously warmest June at 87.4. I know we have several more days left, but we're on track to not only have the hottest May, but now the hottest June. You look at the high temperatures across the area today, and you can see where the 90s and even near 100 degree temperatures are. That's the heat high far down in the southern U.S. We made it to 98 officially for our high temperature today, so just below 100 degrees. But that heat high, it's going to break down. It's flattened out a little bit. Those those temperatures in the 90s to near 100 don't go all the way up to the Canadian border like they did earlier in the week. So the high's already breaking down and it's going to continue to do so. We had a few just measly little insignificant showers here and there earlier today, but let's fast forward. Monday of next week, we're anticipating that shift in our weather pattern. Weaker upper level high and a fairly weak cool front dropping in. So some isolated activity likely on Monday. Then we get into Tuesday and we could actually have some more numerous showers popping up here and there. It's not a slam dunk and it's not guaranteed for everybody. At right now, 30% chance on Monday and we're up to a 40% chance on Tuesday. 91 right now, dew point is 62 temperatures. Well, for the most part, 80s to right near 90. 90 in Castroville and 87 in Bulverde. Case that 12 hour forecast, 76 at 7 a.m. Sunny all day, noon, 92 degrees, and then a high temperature of 100 into the afternoon. And of course, a little bit warmer, closer to the Rio Grande and in typically warmer locations. So next week, that's the focus. We'll be fine tuning the details. Check back in for the updates. All right, cool. All right, so we are less than 24 hours. Tomorrow at this time, we will hopefully know the Spurs picks. Yeah, and right now there's even rumors right now about a trade between Atlanta and San Antonio for DeJounte Murray. And that's even before wow. we start the draft right now. Murray had a great response tonight on Twitter. He actually tweeted out, uh-oh, little thing of popcorn. <laughs> All right, when we come back, the heat is on. Brian Wright, he's the general manager of the Spurs with four picks tomorrow night. We'll get you ready. We are in New York for the NBA draft, and the Aggies running the College World Series over. Big night tomorrow night with the NBA holds his 2022 draft. That's because the Spurs have four picks to continue rebuilding the silver and black after missing the playoffs for the franchise record time three straight seasons. And what puts pressure on general manager Brian Wright so much so is that three of those picks are the first round starting at number nine. There are a number of scenarios that could happen, including treating one or more of those picks to move up. And don't think for one second the magnitude of the situation has not been felt. If you can't tell, I look a little disheveled. No haircut, no sleep. Um, and that's that's all of our group. You know, when you when you have one pick to prepare for, sometimes two, you know, you're trying to do the work to figure out, you know, who could be there at your pick, obviously who you like at the pick and, and what could happen around you. Now you factor that in for four picks, it's a lot more work. Yeah, just who could the Spurs be looking at tomorrow night with more on that? Let's bring in our Larry Ramirez from Brooklyn. 
Thank you very much, Greg, and good evening, everybody. The Barclays Center is getting ready to host the NBA draft for the ninth time. And Spurs fans, well, they're hoping their team strikes gold there tomorrow night. So the Spurs have a total of four draft picks this year, which gives them plenty of options to draft, make a trade to move up, or perhaps trade a draft selection to a team to pick up an established NBA player. Now, Baylor forward Jeremy Sohan is one of the guys being mentioned that the Spurs could select with the ninth overall pick. He can play both the small and power forward spots, and Jeremy can defend just about every position. He's being compared to Boris Diaw, Kyle Kuzma, and Draymond Green. Sohan is 6'9", 230 pounds with a 7-foot wingspan. Earlier this week, he was asked, how does his game fit in the NBA? I feel like I really fit well in the mold of, uh, you know, a hybrid wing uh, forward. I think those are, like, one of the most important positions right now in the NBA, as you can tell in the finals, the playoffs. Um, like the versatility is re really important. I feel like I have that on, on both sides of the court. And I think that's really going to help me adjust to the NBA and I think be long term. Will he become a Spur? We will soon find out. The Spurs have picks number nine, number 20 and 25 in the first round and number 38 in round two. And it all goes down tomorrow night. So Jeremy told the media that he worked out for the Spurs and that he thought it went pretty well. He said he got good feedback and the Spurs continue to stay in touch with him. From Brooklyn to San Antonio, Greg, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Larry. Here it all uh, plays out tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Barclays Center and we'll be live right here on KSAT 12. The Aggies run of the College World Series is over. Next. From the court to the diamond are beginning roughed up on Friday night. The Texas A&M Aggies looking for revenge against the Sooners with a spot in the College World Series Finals on the line. Bottom of the first, Sooners Jimmy Crooks at the play with two men on. This is the first pitch he sees, and he likes it. Deep shot to right, clears the bases, and puts the Aggies up 3-0 in a hole 3-0 early. That will lead to a balloon to five before the Aggies get on the board. Dylan Rock rocks his pitch to the seats and left. The solo home run makes it 5-1 OU. The Sooners got a career performance from pitcher David Sandman. They call him the Sandman for a reason. He he puts the a and bats to sleep. 12 strikeouts over seven innings with five hits and only one run given up. Sooners eliminate the Aggies from the College World Series 5-1. to one. We've been here multiple times. Um, we just tried to keep plugging. Today wasn't our day. You know, it's part of it. I think we've, we've hit that lucky button enough times this season, and I guess today it ran out on us. But um, just, yeah, one heck of a run. The much-anticipated showdown between the top two teams, the United Soccer League's Western Conference standings will take place this Friday night. That's when San Antonio FC travels to Colorado Springs to face the Switchbacks to decide who takes over that top spot. Right now, the Switchbacks own that distinction following the win this past week against Indy 11, 4-3, while San Antonio FC played Oakland Roots to a 1-1 draw at Toyota Field to drop them to second overall. And the much-anticipated, since their first planned meeting last May, had to be postponed after a number of COVID cases on SAFC. It's huge. I mean, I think I was talking to some of the guys and last year we were at our best when we when we started fast and we, we got the first goal. So I think that's something that we really need to get back to uh, and start focusing on is the, the sharp and fast starts of the games. And then, uh, you know, see how it goes from there. The reason they are in first in, in our conference now, uh, you know, how hard it's going to be the game. And we're trying to prepare ourselves like as better as we can to to do a good game over there. And the match is scheduled for 9 p.m. San Antonio time on Friday. And getting back to that reported trade by Bleacher Report that they're trying to work out between Atlanta and San Antonio for DeJounte Murray. Also, Patty Mills weighed in tonight, says he hopes that's just bait out there to see get things going. And if it's true, then he's done watching Spurs basketball. Really? Yeah. Wow, Patty. So, yeah, Patty speaking up on Strong that. Strong statement. You got it. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We're back in two minutes. I want to point out Friday morning, just before sunrise, we're going to have a little five planet parade visible in the sky. If you look off to about the east southeast, you'll see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and even a crescent moon mixed in there. So they'll all be lined up. Ooh. All right. Well, that does it for us here on the night beat. We'll see you tomorrow morning. GMSA at 430.